In this video, we are going to study two basic measures that allow us to study strain and deformation in three-dimensional objects. As shown in the previous video, in order to describe the deformation of an object, we first embed the object in a three-dimensional vector space, and we call that embedding the reference configuration, and every point in the object is represented in the reference configuration by a vector capital X, and X has components x1, x2, and x3, and the set of vectors representing the reference configuration is usually denoted omega naught. A line on the object is a one parameter set of vectors, so the line here that starts in C and goes all the way to D can be represented by a set of vectors x1 of xc, x2 of xc, and x3 of xc. So x, for example, we can set xc to be zero, to give me point C, and, X, and then given a value of XC, I can tra traverse across that line, and for XC is equal to 1, for example, I can reach the point D. The tangent to this line at any point is actually equal to the gradient of each component with respect to XC. So in order for me to find the tangent at this point, all I need to do is calculate partial x1 by partial xc, partial x2 by partial xc, partial x3 by partial xc, which gives me that tangent vector at this point. After deformation, in the deformed configuration, the object is denoted by omega, and every vector is denoted by small x. So x has components x1, x2, and x3. And if I try to follow that same line that goes from c to d, and then if I follow it here, small c to small d, then this small x1, small x2, small x3 are function of time and also function of x of xc, x of xc, x of xc. So this is a function of the original position of the line. The new tangent to the line at this point, I'm going to denote it small n, it's also equal to partial small x1 by partial xc, partial small x2 by partial xc, partial small x3 xc. So this n is equal to partial x by partial xc. Now notice the following. Partial x1 by partial xc, I'm going to be right at the top here. Partial x1 by partial xc. Now I can write x1 as function of the original coordinates. So I can actually write partial x1 as equal to partial x1 by partial capital X1 multiplied by partial capital X1 by partial XC plus partial X1 by partial capital X2 multiplied by partial capital X2 partial XC plus partial X1 by partial capital X3 multiplied by partial capital X3 by partial XC and I can do the same for partial x2 by partial xc and partial x3 by partial xc. And if after doing this, if I take these coordinates or these components and I take them away from these, I can have this matrix equation where the new tangent n is equal to this matrix multiplied by this vector. And this vector is actually the original vector n. And so n, the new tangent to the line, this n is equal to a matrix f multiplied by the original tangent n. Now this f is what I call the deformation gradient. This deformation gradient contains all the information I need locally that would describe how vectors change in length uh, or how vectors change angles with respect to each other. So it really locally describes all the deformations that I want at a particular point. The study of the deformation gradient allows me to break down the deformation at any point to rotation followed by stretch or stretch followed by rotation. Now I'm not going to show you the proof of these arguments. These are more for when you take a solid mechanics radio course. But for now, we can view the deformation to be composed of two steps. In the first step, I stretch the object. Of, so if this is the original object. In the first step, I stretch it. So I get two vectors that are perpendicular to each other. I compress one and extend one or extend both. 
and in the second step I rotate the object or you can think of it as first I rotate the object and then after rotation I stretch the object and so all this information is actually embedded in the deformation gradient the next measure of deformation that I'm going to study is called the displacement gradient tensor the displacement gradient tensor tells me something about the strain in an object as it deforms so if I have an object that's represented in R3 by a set omega naught and if I have a tangent vector d capital X in the reference configuration and if I have a function that maps the reference uh, configuration into the deformed configuration and in the deformed configuration vector capital DX becomes vector d small x in R3 and the deformed configuration is represented by the set omega as we shown in the previous slides, the new vector d small x is equal to the deformation gradient f, a matrix f, multiplied by the old vector dx. Now I'm going to extract the area inside that green circle and I'm going to look at those vectors d capital x and d small x in details. So this is the vector dx before deformation, it becomes d small x, which is equal to a matrix f, multiplied by the vector dx after deformation. The difference between those two vectors, which is equal to d small x minus d capital X, is equal to f dx minus dx, which is equal to f minus i dx, and f minus i is what I call the displacement gradient tensor, which is a matrix or a tensor and denoted gradient of u, or the displacement gradient tensor. And so, if this is small dx and this is capital dx, the difference between them is the gradient of u multiplied by dx, then I can say that small dx is equal to capital dx plus this small vector gradient of u multiplied by dx, and as we studied before, any matrix has a unique decomposition into a symmetric part, an askew symmetric part, I can decompose the gradient of u into its symmetric part and skew symmetric part. The symmetric part I call epsilon, and the skew symmetric part I call the infinitesimal rotation w. And when we study the strain, one of the important strain measures is this epsilon, which is equal to the gradient of u plus the transpose of the gradient of u divided by 2. This has information about how every vector change in length and how vectors change angles between each other as the object deforms. We're going to cover many examples in class, but in general, for the calculations, the displacement u is equal to the new position minus the old position. The gradient of u is equal to f minus i. f is equal to partial small x by partial capital X. i is the identity matrix, and it comes because I'm taking partial capital X by partial capital X. In order to calculate the gradient of u, you have two options, either to calculate f and subtract i, and so you get this matrix or you actually calculate if you have the displacement function you calculate partially one by partial capital x1 partially one by partial x2 and so on and we're going to calculate to show you different examples in class epsilon is calculated by taking half the matrix gradient of u plus its transpose and the infinitesimal rotation tensor is equal to half gradient of u minus its transpose